all of you online will need to say okay that it's okay to be recorded. Um, so I am uh, so pleased to welcome Jim once again to, to, to TBI, albeit virtually. Um, Jim is recognized, Jim Kenny is recognized around the world as a pioneer and leader of the global interreligious and intercultural movement, mm -hmm. serving in key roles in some of the world's key interreligious organizations over the past 30 years, including from 1988 to 2002, founding trustee and later global director of the Parliament of World Religions, which is where Jim and I met when I was working at North Shore with Rabbi Bronstein. He has lectured widely in the U.S. and around the world on the variety of subjects relating to politics, religion, history, and culture. He was, for 45 years, the co-founder and executive director of Common Ground, a groundbreaking adult study center focusing on the world's great religious, philosophical, spiritual, and cultural traditions. He is the author of Thriving in the Cross Current, Clarity and Hope in a Time of Cultural Sea Change, Quest Books, 2010. <laughs> Thriving presents hopeful, challenging, and inspiring vision of progressive cultural evolution in our time. It was written prior to the former president. Anyway, he is currently engaged in a variety of Zoom educational projects, in particular the Global Lecture Hall, which we have the link to, which we will send out to you. Um, it is really my pleasure and my honor to welcome Jim once again to TBI, God willing, one of these days in person. I hope so. Thanks, Laurie. Good to see you again. Good to see you as always. Um, here's the plan. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk for an hour. Uh, so let's say I'm going to go till about uh, 7.50. And then as long as you want to hang around for questions, that works for me. And, and Lori says uh, she's uh, good to hang out for that. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share the screen so you can see the fabulous slides. This takes a minute to get all set up, so be patient. There. And Lori, would you mute, mute everyone, please? Sure. I, ca I can't mute the people here. I can only mute the ones on the screen. <laughs> the people there are going to have to be self-muting starting about now. Okay, when we were fooling around before we began, uh, someone asked me, I think Lori asked me, how woke I am, how woke I consider myself. And I said, hi. It's because I was thinking of this cute little graphic that I found. How do you gauge your wokeness? Are you low, moderate, or high when it comes to being woke? Well, by the time we've had a little bit of conversation and we all understand what, what we mean collectively by woke, I hope that we'll all uh, be inclined to say that we rank high on the wokeness scale. Here's what I call this workshop, Identity Politics, Wokeness, and Critical Race Theory. Uh, if I had a little bit more room on the slide, I could have added several things because we want to talk about identity politics. Certainly, we want to talk about wokeness, which is sort of our, our uh, overarching theme. Definitely want to talk about this whole business of critical race theory. What is it and why are we hearing from the right wing in American politics that it is the worst thing to happen? happen uh, to our culture ever, uh, ever since I think a lot of people on the right would say it's the worst thing since Martin Luther King. Uh, but what is critical race theory and, and why am I going to be saying it's nothing to worry about? It's something to feel good about. But we'll also talk a, just a little bit about cancel culture. What's all this that we hear about cancel culture? Again, that's a pejorative term that we hear from the right. And another pejorative term uh, that, that the right can't get enough of is political correctness. So what do all these things mean and how do they all fit together? And they do, they all dovetail. Uh, if you're woke, uh, it means uh, that you probably are sympathetic to what's called cancel culture, although you would never use that terminology. Uh, you probably endeavor to be politically correct, although you would never use that terminology. Uh, you're very aware of social injustice and lingering racialism and racism in American culture and society. Uh, and you recognize the vital importance of identity politics. So we're gonna start with that, with identity politics. Just what, what do we mean by that? Uh, 
And uh, so we're going to start with three different takes on what we mean by identity politics. Lately, let me just tell you, it's been a big deal, sort of a, a hot topic uh, in Democratic Party circles, uh, this whole idea of identity politics. And the, the notion has been raised uh, by a number of, of liberal-ish uh, critics uh, that the Democratic Party is hampered uh, by being over-invested, over-concerned with identity politics, over-concerned with the rights and identities of Black people, of Hispanic people, of, of women, of Native Americans, of Asians, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, uh, and a number of, of very thoughtful, uh, very respected people have been urging, and I'm going to talk about two of them tonight, just very briefly, have been urging Democrats to get over the identity politics business, drop it, uh, talk only about issues that concern all Americans, concern us all as a whole. Don't go uh, chasing after issues that are of concern only to Black people, or issues, uh, for example, the impact of modern American policing uh, on Black youth. Don't go chasing after issues like that. Don't go asking what are the special needs of Hispanics or of Asians or uh, you, you name it. Uh, instead, just talk about values uh, and issues that concern us all. Well, three of the people or two of the people that have been urging this, one is Francis Fukuyama, who is often identified as a liberal. He's not my idea uh, of a liberal. He's a neoconservative, uh, was one of uh, uh, the major supporters, major voices uh, in support of the Iraq war uh, in the circle around George W. Bush. Uh, he's a liberal in the sense that Adam Smith uh, was a liberal, uh, the sort of founder of laissez-faire economics. But anyway, he's been saying it a lot lately, lose the identity politics. Someone that I have much more uh, affinity with and respect for is Mark Lilla. Uh, Mark Lilla, uh, Fukuyama is a professor at Stanford, uh, a very brilliant guy. Mark Lilla is a professor at Columbia, also a brilliant guy. He writes for New Yorker, New York Review of Books, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, he lately has been saying the same thing that Democrats need to go back to a time before identity politics. Uh, there was a time when all uh, political conversation was about issues that concerned us all, not just black issues, not just women's issues and, and so on. And then uh, a very different point of view uh, by, and this is the person I really agree with, Sarah Churchwell, who's at the University of London. Uh, and uh, Sarah says, there's no such thing as pre-identity politics. And her her argument is that politics in America has been about identity from the get-go. Well, let's see if, if uh, she persuades you. She has persuaded me, so I'll do my best. Uh, and her article appeared in 2019 uh, in uh, the New York Review of Books, NYRB, uh, America's Original Identity Politics. If any of this interests you, uh, you can easily look up that article. Ident All you'd need is uh, Churchwell Identity Politics. It's really uh, worth a read. Uh, anyway, here's what she said, and I'm just going to read it in case you can't see the screen well enough. There are no pre-identity politics, just as there are no pre-identity economics in a country in which political, economic, and legal rights were only ever granted to some identity groups and not to others. Virtually every major event in the long and troubled history of the United States was a direct consequence of identity politics. This article, as you see, appeared in February of 2019. Uh, and here are some, uh, uh, I'm going to give you some examples in a moment, but here's a really interesting thing. You may be aware uh, that there was a humor magazine uh, in the late 19th century, in America, in the late 19th and early 20th century that was called Puck. Puck. And this is a cover uh, from one of the issues of Puck in 1899. I have no idea what month it was. Uh, and let me just tell you what's going on here. Do you see scowling Uncle Sam? Uh, he's uh, looking at this long line uh, of people who are, if you could zoom in, if you could, and I can't zoom it for you, but uh, if you could, you would see that each one of the people in line casting a ballot 
uh, is uh, a visitor from another country uh, who has been transplanted to America. And so each one is dressed up half in American garb and half in the traditional garb uh, of his native country. Uh, so first in line is an Irish American. You see the little pipe and shamrock on the Irish half of him. The most interesting and curious thing to me is that the American half uh, of, of the outfit of each of the people in line, we can only see four of them clearly, uh, but the American half is rendered by the fact that they're wearing uh, a plaid or a check pattern. I have no idea why Huck Magazine decided that that was the most American style of dress you could have. But first is the Irish American, then a German American, then a British American, then an Italian American, uh, and, and so on, right on back. Uh, but the most interesting thing, the title of, of the cover is The Hyphenated American. And Uncle Sam, the quote, you probably can't see it, Uncle Sam, scowling there, is saying, why should I let these freaks cast whole votes when they are only half American? So uh, talk about a, a racist attitude, talk about uh, a hatred of immigrants. To me, it's also fascinating that in 1899 on the cover of a national humor magazine, they would use the word freaks. Uh, I, I had no idea that it was in general usage at the time, but Uncle Sam does not like these half Americans. That's, that's a pure statement of identity politics. And remember the point we're trying to make here is identity politics goes all the way back to the beginning. Is all politics bound up in identity. That's what Sarah Church, uh, Churchwell wants to argue. She says it's always our poli politics have always been about identity. And here are some examples. The Mayflower separatists uh, that, that came here, uh, the pilgrims that came here uh, seeking uh, religious freedom. And then uh, a little bit later came, uh, came the Puritans uh, who were seeking religious freedom for themselves, uh, but were bound and determined not to grant it to anyone else. Uh, but, but those were all about identity. They're Protestant, their respective Protestant identities. Uh, for much of the early history of this country, whites were free and blacks were a slave and enslaved, that's pure identity politics, especially when Blacks start to work toward their uh, freedom. Uh, women's rights, the struggle for women's rights, what could be a better example of the importance of identity politics uh, in American life? Uh, and so here are just some uh, a scattering of things that I thought were relevant. The three-fifths clause, I'm sure you know, it's in the Constitution. Uh, when they were drafting the Constitution, that sweltering hot summer in Philadelphia in 1787, uh, uh, the concern of James Madison was how are we going to get nine of the 13 states, that was what was required, how are we going to get nine of 13 states to ratify this thing uh, when the South uh, is, is very unhappy uh, with the way uh, congressional seats are being apportioned. Southern states wanted their black slaves to be counted because congressional seats were being handed out on the basis of a state's population. So they said, you got to count our slaves. People in the North said, wait a minute, these, you're going to count your slaves, but you won't let them vote. What sense does that make? Well, anyway, a compromise was necessary because uh, the uh, population of the state determined how many congressional seats it had and how many uh, electoral votes it would have in the contest for president. And so uh, the compromise was this. A lot of people don't realize this is written into the Constitution that a slave would count for three-fifths of a white person uh, when you're ta uh, totaling up the population. The one drop rule in the South was that uh, if there was anywhere in your family tree, if it could be demonstrated that anywhere in your extended family was a black person, the one drop of black blood uh, meant that you uh, counted as fully black. The Jim Crow period uh, after the Civil War, uh, which was the organized 100 years of organized denial of basic rights uh, to blacks, uh, rights that were guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, the Klan was the first identity movement in American politics. Uh, and then we get to uh, today. Oh, I skipped over the grandfather clause. That's really important. Did you, did you ever realize that that term that we use all the time, the grandfather clause, uh, meant simply this. Uh, it meant that after the, the 15th Amendment was passed, uh, which guaranteed Blacks the right to vote, Southern states 
came up with dozens of workarounds to prevent blacks from voting. And one was a rule that was in, enacted in many Southern states that if you were a black freed slave, uh, you could vote absolutely as long as you could demonstrate that your grandfather had voted. Well, no slave living had a grandfather that had voted, but that's where the grandfather clause comes from. That's what it originally meant. Interesting, eh? And of course, today, the Black Lives Matter movement countered from the right uh, by the statement that white lives matter. A lot of angst would have been saved uh, if the Black Lives Matter movement had chosen to call itself Black Lives Matter too, because that was their point. They're saying young blacks are being killed out of all proportion by uh, by white policemen. Uh, and so black lives matter. Black lives matter, too. They weren't saying white lives don't matter or blue lives don't matter. Uh, and then uh, the struggle for women's right, for suffrage, uh, for equal pay, for status in the society. Uh, struggles against anti-Semitism, anti-Catholicism, uh, and, and uh, today uh, uh, Islamophobia uh, as well. Uh, and now we're just becoming aware of how, how widespread, how pervasive anti-Asianism is. And of course, birtherism needs to be mentioned. That was Donald, Trump, Donald Trump's ticket uh, uh, to political notoriety, uh, 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 insisting that Barack Obama uh, didn't have a birth certificate, although he showed it again and again, uh, and was not born in this country. All of that is identity politics. It's been with us since the get-go. But if that weren't clear enough, uh, uh, this country was absolutely founded on the principle of individual rights, no doubt about that. If you look at the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, that we, one through 10, that we call the Bill of Rights, they all have to do with individual rights. Don't tell me what I can read, don't tell me where I can assemble, don't seize my property, uh, and, and, and so on, don't subject me to cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, uh, don't tell me what my religion should be, and so on. All individual rights. But gradually, over the next 200 years, and right up to the present day, uh, we began to notice that certain people were denied their individual rights, their rights as individuals. Why? Because they belonged to the wrong groups. They were women. They were Blacks. They were workers. They were the poor. And so the first four great defining struggles uh, in our political culture after the constitutional period, uh, which said all individuals have these rights, uh, uh, came four struggles for the rights of people who were denied their individual rights because they belonged to the wrong groups. So it's the struggle for universal human rights versus what you, you might call uh, our inertial culture. Don't change anything. It's not, it's not broke. What are the basic elements of our inertial culture? A gender, which is to say patriarchy, male rights, whiteness, wealth, power, and privilege. Uh, so what were the four struggles uh, uh, as we moved from the rights of the individual to the rights of the group? Again, identity politics. And being aware of all this is a big part of being woke, which means being aware, being awake, being hip if you will. So what are the four great struggles? The struggle for the rights of women, Blacks, workers, and the poor. Uh, not, I think not a lot of folks are, are aware that these are the first four defining struggles uh, for group rights in our culture. There's Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, one of the pioneers of the struggle for women's rights, which was underway uh, about 10 years before the struggle for the rights of Blacks got underway with people like Frederick Douglass. Uh, do you recognize Samuel Gompers, uh, one of the critical movers and shakers of the American labor movement? And way back in 1960, we see the Poor People's March. You remember that? The Poor People's March. Uh, as a lot of Americans woke up for the first time to the fact that there were people who were desperately poor in America. Four defining struggles. Well, let's move on and define some terms. Woke, and I have a little bit more to tell you about wokeness and where it comes from. It's fascinating. Uh, but uh, to be woke is to be aware of uh, how pervasive racism and social justice are in American history, have been in American history, and are at the present time. What about cancel culture? Now, remember, it's a pejorative term, a disparaging term most often used by the right. And it's a variant of the more neutral call-out culture, 
which means what? Boycotting or shunning some individual or group uh, that acts in an unacceptable way. Uh, someone who is involved in, in sexual abuse or sexual harassment, uh, in racist language or action, that kind of thing. Uh, someone who is, is uh, defiantly unwoke, if you will. Now, it was originally called call-out culture. It grew out of social media, uh, which empowered people to say, look at that person. He's acting uh, in a way that is completely unacceptable uh, in modern, uh, more or less enlightened culture. Uh, so some of the people that have been canceled, people like Bill Cosby or uh, uh, Kevin Spacey or Harvey Weinstein, it's not fair to to put Kevin Spacey in the company of, of those other two, uh, but nevertheless, inappropriate behavior. And here are some more terms. Uh, and we put these all together. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, wokeness, uh, cancel culture or call out culture, political correctness. And then I have one more. Uh, political correctness, which is also a pejorative term uh, that's used by the right uh, to talk about what uh, what uh, people who practice political correctness would would uh, term, for example, respect or thoughtfulness or uh, compassion or empathy, uh, uh, avoiding language uh, that offends or stereotypes or verbally discriminates against people of various genders, races, sexual orientations, cultures, or social conditions. Are they rich? Are they poor? High ranking or low? Uh, so again, political correctness at the beginning only meant being thoughtful, uh, uh, and not practicing hate speech, especially in a public arena. Where did it start? On college campuses. College campuses, as a student organizing groups said, you know, we really don't want to hear from David Duke. Uh, uh, talking about the fact that uh, the essential problem in American life it, uh, comes from blacks and Jews uh, working in some unholy alliance. We really don't need his voice and his message on our college campus. That came to be called political correctness and, and condemned on that basis by the right. And then the most controversial of all these days, especially among people who have no idea in the world what it means, critical race theory is actually something you'd only encounter in law school. Critical race theory is a kind of legal scholarship. Uh, it got going in the 1980s. We're gonna meet very briefly the woman who came up with the term and the idea, a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who's uh, one of the most respected legal scholars in the country. Uh, she holds dual appointments at Columbia and UCLA. How she manages the commute is, is beyond me, uh, but she has the full professorships in both institutions. Uh, and she was the one that gave us the term uh, critical race theory. Uh, and all she means is that the law itself has been the instrument for the uh, preservation, for the establishment, for the building into our culture of racial attitudes and, and racist attitudes uh, that we should have outgrown some time ago. Law, it, it, the practice of law, laws on the books, and so on uh, are in part responsible for the fact that that America retains its racialist, um, much of its racialist character. Uh, and this is a, a reaction. The whole idea of critical race theory uh, is, in her words, it's a reaction to a perceived failure of traditional civil rights litigation to produce meaningful reform. Why is it that Brown versus the Board of Education that desegregated the public schools didn't quite desegregate the public schools? How has law uh, often been an ally uh, of systemic racism? But where do we get the term woke? So I, uh, I have to tell you, it took me quite a while. I went on the hunt. I was going to find out uh, what was the earliest reference to wokeness. And I think I found it uh, in an article that appeared in the New York Times in 1962 by a guy named William, William Melvin Kelly. Uh, and Kelly uh, was wrote a great deal about Black culture and Black idiom and Black music, jazz music, and, and so on. He was an interpreter of his own Black culture uh, to the largely white uh, uh, audience of the New York Times. Anyway, in 1962, he wrote an article. I'm going to blow this up so you can see it better. Uh, that was called, If You're Woke, You Dig It. Uh, and the subtitle is No Mickey Mouse, that means denizen of corporate America. Uh, no Mickey Mouse can be expected to follow today's Negro idiom without a hip, 
assist. Uh, and I'll blow that up in a minute. There's Mickey Mouse for you. Doesn't, doesn't understand black idiom. And off to the side of the article, there was a box. Uh, I don't reproduce the whole box here. Uh, that was called the saying something uh, a lexicon. Uh, uh, it's a black expression. Now you're saying something. So there was a lexicon, a little uh, 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 set of definitions of some of the uh, words and phrases you might hear, uh, as it says there in Harlem or any other Negro community. And one of those was woke. So let's blow it up and take a closer look. Here, standing there and listening to the two black guys talking are Noah Webster and Pierre Roger of the Thesaurus, Webster of the Dictionary, and they're completely puzzled. Uh, they would be hard put to assemble a dictionary of today's idiom. And the one guy is saying, that was my fox, man, and you were copping at my taste in grit. And the other says, well, don't jump salty on me. And Roger and Webster are like, what are they talking about? Uh, if you're woke, you dig it. No Mickey Mouse can be expected to follow today's Negro idiom uh, without a hip assist. By the way, all those terms like don't jump salty on me are defined in the little lexicon box that appears to the right of the article, but we're not going to bother with it. Uh, here are some phrases and words you might hear today in Harlem. Uh, woke, that's the only one I singled out, means well-informed, up-to-date, as in the sentence, man, I'm woke. So it goes back to the 60s at least, almost certainly comes out of the black idiom that we associate with jazz music. So here's, uh, I put woke in the middle of the page and then all around, I'm just gonna fill in things that are part of the orbit or uh, the circle of ideas that surround wokeness. So if you understand that every one of, of the ideas that I, I'm gonna uh, uh, illuminate here as we uh, go around the page, everyone has something to do. It's part of the constellation of wokeness. These are the qualities, uh, the ideas, the understandings uh, that someone who is truly woke, which means alive, awake, uh, and aware of social injustice and racism in our culture and so on. Uh, a person like that would be aware of all these things. So social justice first and foremost, uh, and anti-racism. The, the premier attitude that should be associated with wokeness is, uh, is, is anti-racism. In other words, saying I'm not a racist or I don't have a racist bone in my body or some of my best friends are, uh, that's not enough. Uh, that's not anti-racism, denial that I am a racist. No, anti-racism is taking an active role to diminish uh, racial policies in our culture. And we're going to meet the guy uh, that, uh, that teaches uh, us about that. His name is Kendi, Ibram Kendi, and he is magnificent. Here are some of the ideas that he puts forth. Identity politics, you need to ident uh, understand identity politics if you're going to claim wokeness uh, uh, and uh, an embrace of political correctness. Uh, again, not carried to the extreme, uh, but what is called political correctness, properly speaking, means empathy and respect. Call out culture or cancel culture. Once again, identifying those groups and individuals whose behavior should be uh, unacceptable uh, in a thoughtful, uh, more or less progressive society. Cancel culture, just a, a negative name for the same thing. The 1619 Project, uh, which is a, a, a sort of ongoing history project of the New York Times, uh, the first installment of it, uh, uh, which was headed up by a woman named Hannah, uh, uh, I mean, Nicole Hannah Jones, Nicole Hannah Jones. She won the uh, 2020 Pulitzer Prize uh, for, for this. It's very controversial. Uh, it's an attempt to, to show uh, that slavery uh, was the driving force uh, in most of the major uh, movements and moments in American society society. Uh, historians with, uh, with a great deal of, of reputation as experts on slavery in the Civil War uh, have said that although its purpose is very lofty, uh, its execution is extremely sloppy, uh, and I'm, I'm on board with that. I admire the project very much, uh, uh, but some of the, uh, of, of the ways in which it was carried out, a little bit extreme. Uh, the argument, for example, that the American Revolutionary War was fought uh, almost exclusively 
to preserve the institution of slavery uh, is rejected by by most historians. And yet that's a claim that the project originally made. They've they've walked it back quite a bit. But still, that's part of this whole landscape of wokeness that you hear about critical race theory. We're going to wind up with a few words about critical race theory. Uh, the woman I talked about, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, the uh, legal scholar is the one who gives us critical race theory, uh, which asks the question, how has America's legal system enshrined or preserved, let's say, not enshrined, but preserved uh, far too much of America's racist, racist heritage? Intersectionality is another term that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw added to the legal lexicon. And she says legal scholars ought to be aware uh, that a lot of people uh, who suffer discrimination are not just discriminated against because they belong to one group, but because they might belong to many different groups that are differently discriminated against. Uh, they might be black, but also disabled. They might be black and disabled and gay. Uh, they, uh, you understand? And how do those different identities intersect with one another? And why is it that the legal system uh, doesn't uh, protect people who are discriminated against in very complex ways? Now, you might say that sounds like a, a pretty tough idea to digest. And that's why the only place it's really talked about is in law school. Uh, nevertheless, the idea of intersectionality has sort of filtered down uh, to popular culture, uh, but most of us don't have to wrestle with it. Anti-racism. This is Ibram X. Kendi's argument. We need to be and we need to become as a society, not just not racist, but actively anti-racist. And anti-racist means I'm committed to changing the policies that keep racism alive. His basic idea is that the only, as we'll see, the only reason that racism uh, still survives in our culture uh, is because of racialist policies that are written into our culture, our tradition, and our law. What about gender equity? If I'm if I'm woke. Uh, I need to be something of a feminist. I need uh, to be committed to gender equity, le level playing field between the genders, the opposite of patriarchy. And uh, no one who claims to be woke uh, 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 can ignore the very real problem of economic inequality uh, and how it affects uh, minority groups more than uh, majority groups. Uh, uh, economic inequality has a bigger effect on Blacks and Hispanics and Asians uh, uh, and on women than it does on, on the, the, the mainstream, if you will. So this is my little diagram. I call it the, the woke triangle. Uh, and it's an attempt to make sense of, of what, what works with woke and what doesn't work with woke. Uh, there's a mouthful for you. Uh, but we have wokeness at the top and then what I call mean woke and anti-woke. We'll move through this and see if we can make sense of these. I hope that this little map gives you a sense of what we're talking about and why it's so controversial. Uh, wokeness, if, you're, if you truly are woke, and I understand, you know, the, uh, the uh, ungrammatical character of the expression uh, 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 sort of sticks in the throat a little bit. Uh, but if you're, if you're truly, if you're genuinely woke, uh, you, have, you are in possession of some sort of transformative insight. You've had a, an aha experience. You see things that you hadn't seen before. Uh, I see that there are still lots of people in America that are suffering at the hands of racist attitudes and racist policies. Uh, if you're truly woke, uh, you're involved in uh, something that uh, the feminist movement back in the 60s uh, used to call consciousness raising. They'd get groups together and say, we need to rethink our lives and understand uh, how patriarchy has affected our lives. Well, uh, uh, the person who is uh, trying to be woke needs to have a consciousness raising uh, experience and understand how racism and social injustice continue to affect our lives. But sometimes, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I put up there PJS. This is a, a, an abbreviation that I came up with many, many years ago, uh, uh, so long that it's almost embarrassing. And I'm, I'm very pleased, proud to say it's, it's really caught on. 
uh, people that w work in progressive causes regularly talk about uh, PJS. Here's what it stands for, peace, justice, and sustainability, peace and nonviolent con conflict resolution, justice, social and economic justice and universal human rights, uh, and ecological sustainability. Uh, so uh, to be progressive is to subscribe to PJS. And to be progressive doesn't mean you're on the left. There are plenty of progressives, uh, uh, re progressive Republicans who say to build a progressive culture, we need uh, the private sector uh, and progressive people on the left who say to build a progressive culture, uh, we need uh, an active government. Uh, and the two sides can and often do and often have work together. Uh, so this is, this is the center, I believe, of, of real quality uh, value structures in American life, PJS. But what, what do I mean by when I say mean woke? Uh, people who sort of lord it over other people, who, uh, who are triumphalist is an actual term, triumphalist in saying, I'm so woke and you're so not woke. Uh, and uh, essentially that attitude is characterized first and foremost by smugness. We all know people like this, don't we? I mean, who are so insufferably smug uh, about whatever it happens to be. They're so woke uh, that they can't tolerate uh, the, the still sleepy headed rest of us who aren't quite as woke as they are. You know, what's really involved there is projection. Uh, and projection just means identifying flaws uh, uh, within me or taking flaws within me that I can't face and, and projecting them onto you. Uh, on the other side, we have uh, anti-woke, uh, which I think grows out of privilege. Uh, the privileged folks in our society who deny that there's a problem. There are people who, who say every day, there's no such thing as a racist problem in America. It just doesn't exist. Well, that denial is, of course, false. Uh, and it comes from people who, who enjoy all the privileges uh, of life in a white-dominated society. Uh, and uh, oh, I have to always glance around to see what lit up next. Yeah, uh, for, for the denialists, and this, as we'll see, is going to be the right side of the political equation. Uh, their bugaboo is people that they call SJWs. And an SJW, get this, is a social justice warrior. Do you know that Glenn Beck used to say all the time when he was, still had a spot on Fox News, he used to say, if your rabbi or your priest or your pastor ever starts to talk to you from the pulpit about social justice, get out, get up, run away, uh, because uh, that person is a socialist or a communist. Imagine uh, I'm not even sure what it would mean to be a Jew or a Christian uh, uh, and, and uh, have nothing to say about social justice. Uh, anyway, I don't have to explain that here, uh, but uh, uh, the right wing hates SJW, social justice warriors. So we're going to put that there to emphasize that. So uh, if PJS and wokeness is the center, the best, the good hearted center of the American political order, I want to believe. Uh, mean woke tends to uh, be something that happens uh, not exclusive, not only, uh, uh, and uh, not necessarily in a widespread way, but where are you going to find it? You're going to find it on the left side of the spectrum. Where are you going to find anti-wokeness? On the right side of the spectrum. Doesn't mean that everybody on the left is, is mean about their wokeness, or that everybody on the right is anti-woke, uh, but that's where you find these two sets of ideas. And when I think about mean wokeness, it reminds me of religious dogmatism. You know, the person who's so sure uh, that he or she is right uh, as to turn to the rest of us with pure contempt. You know, uh, my truth is the only truth, my exclusive truth. Uh, and religious dogmatism is bad enough, but worse by far is religious fanaticism. And anti-wokeness reminds me of that. The phrase intentionality is very interesting here. I think that wokeness, uh, uh, it's something that I celebrate uh, and, and really admire uh, in others uh, because uh, it, it is intentional. Uh, people who write and talk about ethics and morality often use, the and healthy psychology, often use the term intentionality, which simply means awareness of how I am moving through life. How am I tending? 
How is my compassion tending? How's my integrity tending? Uh, and to be uh, alive and awake and aware of how I'm tending to move through life, that's intentionality. And it's a quality highly uh, prized or highly to be prized and sought after. The opposite of intentionality, knowing what you're doing, knowing where you're going and doing, uh, uh, doing life in a thoughtful way. What's the opposite? It's not, nothing less than ideology. I know a lot of people think ideology just means your value system. It doesn't. Ideology is a starkly negative term. If somebody calls you an ideologue and they know the language, you've been insulted. You don't want to be an ideologue. You don't want to be ideological because that means intellectual tunnel vision. It means the person who says, don't bother me with facts, my mind is made up. Uh, the person who is a climate change ideologue, a climate change denier who does it in an ideological way cannot be persuaded by any new information. There's no new fact or set of information or observations that you can bring to such a person uh, in, in such a way that he or she will say, oh, now I see, now I understand. No, the ideologue is locked up tight and it's the last thing you want to be intellectually. Uh, but uh, the anti-woke folks uh, and the, the mean woke folks tend toward ideology uh, just in the same way that the woke folks uh, tend toward intentionality. And then just to cap this whole thing off, I stole a Coke cap and made it a woke cap. Stay woke. Here's just a little quick you know, bit. You know, this, this idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff. I, you should get over that quickly. The world, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. People who you are fighting may love their kids. And, you know, share certain things with you and 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 i think that what one danger i see among young people particularly on college campuses malia and i talk about this you know, I goes to school with my daughter um but i do get a sense sometimes now among certain young people and this is accelerated by social media there is this sense sometimes of the way of me making change is to be as judgmental as possible about other people and that's enough. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or use the word wrong verb, or then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself. Cause man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. <laughs> Let me get on TV, <laughs> watch my show, watch Gronish. <laughs> um, you know, that's not, that's not activism. That, that's not bringing about change. You know, it, 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 if, if all you're doing is casting stones, uh, you know, you, you're probably not going to get that far. That's easy to do. That's about as good a description of what, what I mean by mean woke uh, as, as you can come up with. And here's unwoke. Here's anti-woke. And believe it or not, these T-shirts uh, are, are widely sold. They're going like hotcakes on the political right. I'm anti-woke. Cancel, cancel culture. Imagine walking around in a, uh, a shirt with this emblem on it, awake. Uh, no, I don't want to be awake. Wake the woke. I, I'm not woke. I prefer sleep. Okay, I mean, uh, you're, you're really disclosing a lot that you don't want to disclose, perhaps. Uh, but this is all real. These are real T-shirts. Okay, uh, just a word or two about cancel culture. And I thought an easy way to do this would just to be to listen to three different voices uh, with three different uh, assessments of cancel culture or call out culture and how it works in our society. So here's one, cancel culture has a place. It helps to call out and remove uh, problematic people from mainstream culture. That's true enough. Let's call cancel culture what it really is. It's our way to exert some control uh, over a world that's becoming more dangerous and less tolerant, okay? 
And then here's someone that really doesn't care for it. In a cancel culture, we appoint ourselves the arbiters of right and wrong, and also the judge and jury, because thanks to social media, we get to dole out punishment. And that's true. And sometimes cancel culture or call out culture uh, can be very mean, can be an example, an exemplification of mean wokeness, uh, just what Barack Obama was talking about there. That's, of course, the Twitter symbol, the little Twitter bird, canceled with the hashtag canceled. Who gets canceled? Uh, uh, the, the essence of, of cancel culture is accountability. Accountability for people uh, that ha have typically been accountable to no one. Either they're too rich or too powerful or too high up or too famous uh, and they can get away with murder. Well, the advent of social media made it possible to say, take a look at this behavior. It's not acceptable uh, in uh, a 21st century society. And that's the basic idea of call out culture. Uh, it has absolutely allowed marginalized communities uh, a, a new opportunity to assert their values uh, and to protest racism, uh, discrimination, either social or cultural, sexual harassment uh, and sexual abuse, for example. But now the whole, uh, all these original concerns uh, that we really ought to come together and identify these behaviors that need to be uh, uh, thinned out in American society, uh, that's all been obscured because cancel culture has just taken its place as just one more front in the left-right culture wars. And here's a couple of folks that, that tend these days to get canceled. Thomas Jefferson, because he owned slaves uh, and, and uh, uh, had relations and children with Sally Hemings, and, and John Adams, uh, because he ignored the advice of his wife, Abigail, who kept, kept saying as he would go off uh, to meetings like the Constitutional Co Convention, where she told him, now, John, don't forget the ladies. He promptly forgot the ladies who are scarcely mentioned, not mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, so a lot of people say we ought to get, you know, uh, tear down the statues of Adams and Jefferson as well, as long as we're tearing down the statues of Confederate generals. I will say I approve of the latter, uh, but I, I, I certainly don't want to see the Jefferson Memorial come down. Uh, because uh, do you know that it was actually, and I looked this, I made the calculation today, it was 195 years and 162 days ago. Uh, that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died. Did you know that they died uh, on the same day in 1826? And did you know, I'm sure a lot of you do, that day was the 4th of July. Isn't that amazing? They had been estranged for many, many years after their presidencies, but in the last 12 years of their lives, uh, they got back together and they exchanged letters, writing letters for posterity, and their correspondence is one of the most important sets of documents uh, of the early republic. Uh, but anyway, they died on, the, on that day, 4th of July, 1826, which was 50 years to the day after uh, the supposed signing of the Declaration of Independence, which had actually been signed the day before, but we celebrate the 4th of, 4th of July, 50 years to the day. And supposedly John Adams' last words were, Jefferson still lives. We don't know if that's true, but I, I, I love to believe that it is. So I said about these two, look, they have helped to set the cultural alarm clock that finally woke us up. Uh, without Adams and Jefferson and people of their ilk, uh, we wouldn't be as awake as we are today. Yeah, Jefferson owned slaves, uh, but he also wrote profoundly uh, about the evils of slavery. And what you want to avoid in situations like this is what they call the historian's fallacy. And the historian's fallacy means taking the morals and ethics and standards of your day, carrying them back uh, to a much older time and applying them there and saying, why don't you, George Washington, measure up uh, to the standards that have evolved uh, uh, to inform our lives in the 21st century? The historian's fallacy, worth remembering. So what do we mean by uh, politically correct? Uh, again, just returning to touch base with that again. Language that avoids offending, oh, I think I might have said this already. Uh, uh, yeah, I did. I showed uh, a different color slide, but it had absolutely the same content. So uh, as Emily Latella used to say, never mind. Uh, but political correctness began as a campus-based opposition to hate speech. We don't want David Duke coming here uh, and, and so on. Uh, it's 
but political correctness is not just speech prohibition, it is enactive, to use a philosophical term. It acts, it enacts something, it does something concrete. Uh, it is not just a set of rules, it is advocacy for a higher set of principles uh, it, when it's properly lived. Uh, it's testimony, a vital source of knowledge. If I'm acting in, uh, 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 I, I prefer socially correct rather than politically correct, socially and morally correct, uh, it's testimony. My action testifies uh, to the kind of world I'm willing uh, to, to struggle to build. And it's political action urging change. Think about it that way. Uh, to be politically correct or socially and morally correct, much better, uh, is, is to engage in political action that urges change. I hope some of this resonates uh, with some of us. Political correctness should make you think, but if it stops you from thinking, there's a problem. And do you see how it's possible for political correctness to slide over into mean, woke, mean political correctness? If it stops you from thinking, I don't want to hear from, uh, if, if I'm a feminist and I don't want to hear the voices of men, uh, uh, if I'm a masculinist and I don't want to hear the voices of women, if it stops me from thinking, then there's a problem. And now, uh, as we wind down here, uh, is Ibram Kendi, and I want you to, to meet him. Uh, his book, Stamped from the Beginning, uh, the name is borrowed from a speech that was given by Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia, uh, who said, the difference between the black man and the white man is stamped from the beginning of the universe. In other words, God wrote it that way. God writ it that way, that the black man is always and permanently inferior to the white. Nothing we can do about it. It's stamped from the beginning. And he calls it, the subtitle is, The, uh, the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. Uh, and it really is that. It's a, a huge book, uh, but it's, boy, is it a good one. Uh, but he decided to team up with a guy who writes young adult fiction, is a wonderful writer for young people, named Jason Reynolds. Uh, Ibram Kendi says, Jason Reynolds is twice the writer I am. And so they teamed up to write a short version, a much shorter version, and it's not dumbed down, uh, but, but made more accessible for a younger audience. And I encourage a lot of adults who don't feel like plowing through the 500 pager uh, to pick up uh, this book has a different title. It's called Just Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. Uh, it's got all the same material that's in the big book, uh, but, uh, but written uh, so that high school and college kids uh, can understand it. And I'll tell you, uh, it works for, for us uh, who are a bit longer in the tooth than that. Uh, if you don't, I've read both of them. Uh, and if you don't have all the time in the world, I enthusiastically recommend that you read the shorter version, Stamped. It doesn't talk down to you. You won't mind it. Here's how we used to think about race, right? Remember this was in our high school textbooks, the Caucasoids and Africoids and Mongoloids and uh, what are sometimes called Amerind and Australoid. Do you know that as far as geneticists and anthropologists and students of human culture are concerned, these racial categories are gone. They're gone. Uh, yes, you can identify someone, someone's facial structure and color, hair texture, structure of uh, uh, nose and, and mouth and ears and eyes. Okay, you can identify that. But the old idea of race is that once you've identified somebody's race, you know something about their intellect, their health, their athletic ability, their morality, their stick to and their general quality as a human being. And that part is false. No connection whatsoever between uh, uh, the stuff that's in your head, basically. I mean, your color, your hair, uh, your uh, facial shapes and so on. No connection between that and your intellect. No connection even between that and your athletic ability. That surprises a lot of people. Athletic ability is tied to ethnic traditional culture, 
uh, people from Somalia and Ethiopia uh, in those desert climbs uh, encouraged young people uh, to be able to run for days and days and miles and miles as messengers. And so it's not surprising that when a marathon comes around, uh, an Ethiopian or a Somali is likely to win. But that has nothing to do with race. It has to do with culture, uh, with ethnicity. Uh, so uh, this is the reality of race. Uh, look, we look different, and yet we all smile the same. I love this uh, set of faces uh, because you have the strong sense that they're all experiencing the same emotion and, and they don't have different access to that emotion because they are of different races. Racial differences are minor, inconsequential differences. So no scholar or scientist talks much about race these days. So do you see what I'm saying here? Uh, to be a racist, you have to be profoundly ignorant, uh, but we already knew that, didn't we? Here's the reality of race, and you understand these are, are artificial intelligence generated faces, computer generated faces, all more or less the same, but with different, slight different racial characteristics. But look what's written underneath. There is no gene for race. Here's the, the definitive text by Robert Wald Sussman. Sussman, the myth of race, the troubling persistence of an unscientific idea. So Ibram Kendi says, human subspecies don't exist. That's what we meant by races, you know? Subspecies of, of the, the genus uh, Homo and, and, uh, and, and so on, uh, and of our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, subspecies don't exist. The races essentially really don't exist. Human populations are so genetically mixed uh, that uh, racial characteristics do not correlate with intelligence, motivation, morality, athletic ability, and so on. They just don't. Skin color is not linked to those things. Uh, the racist conception of race, sadly, tragically, uh, and ironically, the racist conception of race is entirely bogus. Here, I'm uh, going to skip ahead uh, just a little bit and, and talk about, uh, as we uh, wind down, talk about three ideas that are really critical to Ibram Kendi uh, and three ideas that are critical to Kimberly Crenshaw. They often collaborate. She's the one that presented us with critical race theory. And they both agree that segregationism is the most abject, the worst, the purest form of racism. It's the assertion that black, brown, native, Asian people are inherently and permanently inferior. Get those two words, inherently and permanently, can't be fixed, inferior to white people. Uh, uh, whoops, didn't mean to repeat that. And I certainly didn't mean to repeat it three times. This is pure racism. And I want you to look at these faces. We're back in the 50s uh, during the desegregation time and look at the hate on the faces of those two young women in front. And I often think, I wonder where they are today and uh, are they still as filled with hate today? I would like to think that they're not. But the saddest part of the picture is the little boy there holding a sign. Part of it is cut off, but the full sign reads, all I want for Christmas is a clean white school. If you let blacks into our school, it won't be clean anymore. Imagine that. I hope he's gotten better. And this is the sit-in uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, that changed uh, uh, racial policies uh, for the Woolworth chain nationwide, eventually, uh, and for stores across the South, the first sit-in. By the way, uh, when this store was turned, uh, torn down, the Smithsonian moved in, bought that section of counter and those four stools where the four young kids from a nearby technical college had sat down that first day, beginning uh, a long, long period of sit-ins, and they uh, created a mock-up, and that's on display now, permanent display at the Smithsonian. I just love that winding down, but uh, the, the next thing that, uh, that Kendi and Kimberly Crenshaw, the critical race theory woman, talk about uh, is assimilationism. And their argument is that although most of the abolitionists uh, and Abraham Lincoln himself, and a lot of people today uh, uh, who uh, pride themselves on being uh, not racist, 
on not being racist are actually racist in a different way. They're assimilationists. They believe that non-white people can achieve equality. How? By becoming more like whites. What you blacks need to do is whiten up. You need to dress like us. You need to talk like us. You need to lift yourself up and live like white people, and then you'll be okay. You have no biological or genetic flaws, uh, but uh, years of, of enslavement have, uh, have reduced your culture to rubble. So you have to be like us. Uh, assimilationism, uh, Kendi believes, is more dangerous than segregationism because it's insidious, and superficially, at least, it's acceptable. Here are a very famous post-Civil War picture. And the point is that uh, the freed slaves there are all moving the men, not the women, you notice, but the men moving in the direction of white deportment uh, and uh, white dress. We're almost done. And both Kendi uh, and Krim Kimberly Crenshaw say, if you want to understand the message of critical race theory, if you want to understand the message of stamp from the beginning, uh, uh, the, the essential call is you need to step up and be an anti-racist. Any, an anti-racist idea is any idea that suggests that racial groups, despite all their apparent differences, are equals, that there's nothing right or wrong with any racial group. Yes, there are racial groups that have bigger problems, more young men in prison, uh, lower educational achievement, but that has to do with the overall culture, with the structure of the culture. Kimberly Crenshaw says, I want to understand as a professor of law, what is it about our legal structure that has made it so difficult uh, for, uh, for young black men uh, to break out of, of these cultural traps? Anti-racist ideas argue that racist policies are the cause of racial inequities. It's not the other way around. Uh, the races weren't unequal and therefore racist policies were adopted. No, first the racist policies were adopted. People were enslaved. Why? Because they were hated or, or uh, regarded as less worthy? No, because they were weak and because they could be enslaved. S enslavement came before racial discrimination. Radical idea, isn't it? And both Kendi and Kimberly Crenshaw want to get that across to us. Anti-racism, and then we'll stop, uh, judges attitudes and policies in terms of their consequences, not their emotions or intentions. What's important is not that you tell me, I don't have a racist bone in my body, or Donald Trump, who actually said, uh, when he was confronted about some of his racist utter utterances, he said, I'm the least racist person in the world. He said that. But that's the emotion and intention, perhaps. Uh, but let's talk about consequences. Okay, millions more things to talk about. Uh, but I think at this point, need to hear what you're thinking about. And I hope some of this made some sense. And I hope there are some new ideas worth mulling over. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, those of you who are at home, if you have questions you want to put it in the chat, I will be happy to um, share them with Jim. Um, is, are there people here who have questions, comments? Michael. What about the uh, situation out in San Francisco? I can't remember if it was the 70s or the 80s, where they wanted to teach black slang in the schools, and the guy it was a professor down in Texas who said these people, people there have to work in a white society, let them learn the language. Yeah, this is, uh, the, the idea was not that, uh, that white kids should learn uh, how to speak uh, in black patois. Uh, the name for that, that speech was Ebonics, Ebonics. Uh, and uh, it wasn't that we wanted to teach our white high school kids how to speak like blacks, uh, but that uh, there were scholars who were studying Ebonics as a legitimate dialogue, not as broken English or defective English, but uh, I didn't mean dialogue, I meant obviously dialect, as an authentic dialect like a, a, a Creole uh, or a Pigeon or Patois and so on. So that was the, the whole point. Uh, but, you know, that argument from the guy you say is from Texas, I have no doubt uh, that that just sounds right. Uh, uh, but, uh, pardon? 
He was a black professor from there. It uh, doesn't matter. Black. He's from Texas. <laughs> and, and, and here I here I am being doing the same thing that they're doing. Uh, but do you understand that argument that you you need to function in white society? Therefore, you need to get over speaking like a black because to our white ears, that sounds ignorant. Uh, to uh, uh, you're not going to get a job in a white in a white shoe law firm, for example. Uh, uh, you're not going to get a job. You need to do you understand. First of all, that's assimilationism. And it's the same attitude uh, that says we should not be teaching uh, other languages in our schools. There should be no bilingual education. Uh, mm -hmm. So someone who's, who has, has spoken Spanish natively and also speaks English uh, uh, perfectly, uh, the idea that there should be Spanish classes and English classes available at the same time, people say, no, America is an English-speaking country. Do you know we're the, just about the only country uh, in, the, in the world where you'll find people that want to penalize bilingualism? It's the most ridiculous thing. I, we have nieces and nephews. Uh, uh, my wife's sister married a Swiss, and of course they grew up in Switzerland. Uh, their English is better than their teacher's English because they used to spend summers with our kids. But they also speak, uh, well, our, uh, uh, one of our nieces is a doctor. She practices now in California, uh, but she did her uh, residencies in Argentina, France, Iceland, Spain, and uh, somewhere else, all in the native languages. So she's got Icelandic and French and Italian and German, uh, and, and her English is beautiful with a charming, uh, a charming accent. Uh, but we uh, want to make sure that our kids are not, not all of us, but some, uh, want to make sure that our kids are not tainted by another language. That, by the way, the whole Ebonics thing blew over uh, because I'll, I'll tell you why, uh, in order for something like that to have legs, to have a life, you need a generation of graduate students that are interested in studying it, and there just weren't any. Nobody wanted to pick it up and run with it. Uh, so, but I think the guy had a point that Ebonics uh, probably was black patois, uh, was a legitimate patois, a legitimate dialect that had its own rules that was just as strict with its own built-in grammatical rules as English was. Uh, it's, it's neither here nor there now. But that's a really interesting question. I'm sorry I rattled on for so long. That's a danger in asking me something interesting. <laughs> Michael, you have another question? Another comment. Uh, I lived in a uh, mixed neighborhood uh, when I was 21 down in uh, south, the near south side. And I used to play ball in a black school. And I, this was right when segregation was starting, when they were starting to bring segregation into the northern, into the northern Chicago public school system from the black schools. And this one African American black guy, he said there was no. This was a time when when black power was very popular, and he said there is no such thing as black power. There is no such thing as white power. There's only one kind of power in this country, and that was green power. And I could tell the difference between kids that were working and were over 21 and working in a white black society and kids that were still in high school that never really mixed with white kids. And I was a big, I was really in favor of integration at that time, and still am, because I said it, 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 you learn to live with each other, which I yeah, thought was I a could. thing. The other thing is a great book is called Freedom's Daughter. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or read it, but no. it's a fantastic, it's a short book. It's absolutely fantastic. It's about, you know, what it was like in the South during the uh, early 60s and the integration period and everything else like that. And they talked about Rosa Parks and all the guys, the four guys and everything else. It was an absolutely interesting, fantastic book. And it's Freedom's Daughter? Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm writing it down. I wanted to check it out. And I couldn't agree more about, uh, about integration and learning to live with each other. Uh, the one thing, again, to watch out for, Ibram Kendi, I can imagine if he were sitting here, he would say, yes, integration is absolutely vital, learning to live with each other. But watch out that when you talk about immigration, I know this doesn't apply to you, but when we talk about immigration, watch out that we're not really talking about assimilation. You know, whiten up. 
Uh, but that's not what you were talking about because you said learning to live with and respect each other. That's right. exactly right. Exactly right. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Yes, we got more. Question. Um, uh, Brown Kindy would say, watch out, assimilation, etc. Who gets to decide, or is this a, a forever conversation of what is the standard right thing to do in medicine? We call it the standard of care where almost everybody agrees what's supposed to be done and has become the standard. So who gets to make standards now? Well, you know, if you're, if you're talking about a, a profession, professions have the luxury of having standard setting bodies uh, and those, those of us who choose to belong to the profession, we give- Excuse me, I'm sorry. Let me just finish my, my first reaction. But you hear that, Jim? He said he used um, the example of a homeowners association, sort of yeah. setting rules for the. Yeah, uh, again, a homeowners association uh, is an artificial structure. I'm not, I'm not saying that critically, but it's an artificial structure that's put in place. Uh, the way, however, the, the way that real standards and the, the way that culture develops uh, and the way that members of a given culture, and I mean a broad, expansive culture, uh, begin gradually to come to agree on what should be the standard uh, uh, behavior between different social and cultural groups, how they ought to respect one another and treat one another and so on. That comes from the bottom up. That's not imposed top down the way the AMA might or the way the Homeowners Association might or the way the ABA, the Bar Association might. Uh, in, in real, uh, in authentic culture, we gradually build from the bottom up uh, and we get to the point where more and more and more and more of us agree uh, that there is a, a, a certain spectrum of uh, acceptable spectrum of behavior uh, for, in the case of your question, how we ought to live together, how we ought to treat one another, uh, what sorts of standards we ought to apply to our interactions, and so on. And uh, sadly, uh, I have to say sadly, it takes a long time for a culture to move from, uh, let's say, uh, from the period when segregation is the law of the land. And even in the North, uh, even in the North, people that were opposed to slavery certainly didn't want Blacks moving in to their neighborhoods. I mean, they were still strictly segregationist. Uh, uh, it takes a long time for a culture uh, to move beyond that and to say, you know, that's always and everywhere wrong uh, and to begin to uh, open up. But the, the true sign for me, one of the things I, uh, the thing that's closest to my heart, what I write about most is cultural evolution. Because I do believe that cultures become wiser and deeper, uh, more compassionate uh, and, and so on over time. And the, the great, the greatest, uh, the, the battery for that, the empowerment, the energizer for that is uh, always the hope of the next generation. Just think of, uh, the youngest people in our lives, think of our grandchildren, for example, uh, many of us have grandchildren, think about them. They are not like many of us, uh, most of us are perhaps uh, post-racist, I, I hope, we got over it. Most of us are post-sexist, we got over it. Most of us are post, uh, you understand what I'm, I'm saying, we've struggled uh, and won through and changed our attitudes. Maybe we were, some of us, in the vanguard of those attitude changes. And then we step back and take a look at our, our children and our grandchildren, and we realize uh, they didn't overcome their racism or their homophobia or their sexism. They never had it. And so uh, I think we get a lot of credit for that. Uh, but it makes me, first and foremost, a believer that there is such a thing as cultural evolution. Uh, I often say to people, and, and this seems to fit in the context of uh, uh, all the questions, uh, I often say to people, strike up an imaginary conversation with your great-grandparents and ask them how they feel about the environment. They haven't had a thought about the environment. Ask them how they feel about race. Ask them how they feel about the role of women in society. Ask them how they feel about interreligious relations. 
And you know, you're going to get answers on every one of those questions from your great, great grandparents that are uh, horrifying to you and shocking to you. Your, your grandparents weren't quite, uh, you know, had, had come a long way. Your parents had come a long way. Uh, I'm sure we all pat ourselves in the back and say, we've come a long way. Now have that conversation uh, with your grandchildren or your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, uh, and, and see if, if you don't come away as a believer in cultural evolution. How are we doing regarding the tolerance of minority groups compared with recent years? Well, let me say, Lori, there, uh, I, I, I don't mean to be critical at all, uh, but let me say I've spent the last most of my adult life involved in the global interreligious world. And one word that uh, is never used in that, in that world is tolerance. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because tolerance is, is really a low bar. Uh, we, we, and I know you mean something much more by it than that, but I, I do want to point out that tolerance is not the standard we should be setting. Tolerance means it's okay with me if you exist, uh, but I'm not thrilled about it. Uh, so we want something beyond tolerance. We want mutual respect and engagement and that sort of thing. And I can tell you after... Uh, almost 40 years in the global interreligious movement, uh, that field of, of developing respect, insight, understanding, cooperation, uh, empathy uh, for people of other religions has grown phenomenally. It's, it's one of, of the most exciting things uh, that I've ever witnessed in my life. So uh, the news there is, is very good, so I think. Great. And so this was another Lori who asked that question, and she thanks you. Yeah, that and was that, Lori Fishman, right? Yes, it was, who's amazing and fights for social justice and sustainability all the time. Um, any other questions? Great. Um, back there, and then we'll um, move forward. Um, just a, this is a little anecdote first. When you said that young children are not born with any racism or prejudice, uh, this one happened about maybe 19, 20 years ago. Our granddaughter went to preschool and she came home and she said to me, I'm English. And we said, why are you English? Well, my friend speaks Russian and she comes from Russia. I speak English, so I'm English. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to say is you said things take a long time to happen. And I don't think that accepting um, sexual change in our society took, took that long. Uh, from what I understand, this happened pretty quickly. So are you referring to the LGBTQ? Yes. So I think, I think Jim would probably agree that that social movement was probably one of the quickest we've seen in U.S. history. Um, and thank God for that. Well, there are two, you know, it, it, the women's movement uh, was phenomenal. You know, if you think about it, I r remember that uh, my adult daughters, they were both in their 20s at the time, uh, or two of them, we have three, but two of them were present. They're both in their 20s. And we were watching uh, a videotape, uh, video series of David Halberstam's wonderful book, The 50s. If you've never read it, it's fabulous, uh, but it's been translated into about 12 hours of video. Well, we were watch watching a section uh, on, uh, oh, the, the, the new uh, homemaker uh, in the 50s. And uh, the, part of it was a commercial for appliances and so on. And the woman who was, I'm sorry for the use of this word, but it's the only word that works. She was flouncing around her kitchen. She wasn't <laughs> Betty Furness, but she should have been. Uh, mm -hmm. Betty Furness, and she was just going around the kitchen and touching her. I'm sure they maybe I've added this, but I, I think they were all avocado, uh, her refrigerator and her stove and so on. And my life is so wonderful. And it's so simple. And it's all just the push of a button. My two daughters are on the floor, uh, <laughs> just hysterical and saying, essentially, tell me, father, it was never thus. <laughs> They couldn't, they were just overwhelmed. They thought it was so comical. And that to me is a sign of how fast and how far. Uh, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton would say, no, 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 wait a minute. 
we started in the in the 1830s uh, and we went to jail and we were beaten uh, and uh, we called ourselves suffragists and they called us suffragettes and made fun of us and Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, sat by where we were when we were hauled off to jail so it took a long time uh, the the change in our attitudes toward gays and homophobia seemed like it happened overnight uh, but once again people in the gay community would say let's go back to 1969 to the stonewall inn and let's go back to earlier in the 60s to san francisco and so on this is a struggle that's been going on uh, uh, for quite a while but having said all that that it took a while the women's movement was lightning fast by comparison with the movement for civil rights, the movement for gay rights was faster still. I, I always think that one of the most amazing things is watching uh, political figures on the right saying, oh, no, 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 I've always been in favor of gay civil union. Well, no, you live in the age of YouTube. We've got you on tape <laughs> or on disc uh, saying something entirely different. So, uh, but you're right, These, uh, uh, it's how, I. I'm sorry, what I'm stumbling and trying to get out is how can anybody not believe in cultural evolution? Right. And we do have gay marriage and we still don't have an equal rights amendment, so. Yeah, uh, and there's always, uh, Laurie, I have to say, there's always somebody who says, yeah, let's don't get carried away. We still this and we still, and you're absolutely right. Long way to go. And I usually preface my remarks by saying, look how far we've come, but look how far uh, we still have to go, but not, not to acknowledge how far we've come since the 60s, since the movement first uh, uh, began to be recognized as a movement, although it had been around uh, for uh, 130 years, uh, uh, not to recognize how far we've come is to make a mistake. Absolutely. Uh, Barbara. Um, playing devil's advocate a little bit, um, we've we talked about forgiving, and I'm putting that in air quotes, uh, Jefferson. Um, where, do, where do we, do we ever forgive Bill Cosby? I mean, he has a compendium of, of um, work that he did, and he didn't write anything, but he was, he was a, you know, he did some great children's programming. Um, yeah. I'm not suggesting that he be forgiven, but I'm wondering, is there any comparison or contrast between those, between what we forgiven and what we haven't yeah. forgiven? What, but what you're talking about is the, the nature of the offense. Uh, and and I, I'm not one that's saying we should forgive Jefferson. Uh, I... I'm actually arguing something a little more controversial. I don't think we're in a position to bring charges against Jefferson. Do you see what I mean? Okay. Uh, because that's committing the historian's fallacy. We're saying, Tom, you should have realized back then at a time when nobody realized. Uh, okay. You should have realized how, how wrong this was. Well, uh, uh, from what sources would he have drawn? Even the abolitionists of the time thought that black culture was radically inferior to white culture. Uh, so, uh, but Bill Cosby, we don't have to uh, commit the historian's fallacy to say what you did was by the standards uh, to which we have all come together simply wrong, simply unacceptable. And does your body of work uh, uh, somehow balance the scales? It, it actually doesn't for me, uh, but I also don't wanna set myself up in a position uh, to, uh, to judge someone uh, whose full story I don't know. I feel much more comfortable judging Harvey. Well, that's why I didn't bring him up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That that uh, as I said, I, I, I feel the same discomfort about Bill Cosby. I felt terrible about it. I I I'll tell you the one that makes me feel really uncomfortable, and that I think might have gotten something of a raw deal, uh, is uh, Garrison Keillor. Uh, and Garrison Keillor has been, I think, just remarkable. He said, "Well, you know, there really is another side to the story." And the other one that I thought got short shrift and was very unfairly treated by his colleagues and so on is Al Franken. Without I think that was, that was simply wrong. Simply yep. wrong. He was, he was mugging for the camera 
uh, and the the person that that uh, uh, many 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 years later brought uh, the complaint against him uh, was uh, working with Fox News, and you know I mean there are too many things, uh, and and Kirsten Gillibrand was all too quick to lead the charge, I yeah. think. Agreed. Thank you. I've taken off my mask to speak. Um, Jim, you're speaking to a Jewish group here, and one of the one of the terms that really? you <laughs> very quickly was intersectionality, and that right now for for Jews for people who are sympathetic to the state of Israel is a really really potent and dangerous thing. You know, a hundred years ago, Jews were not considered white. And somehow over the last century, we've become not just white, but um, uh, part of the oppressor class. And the state of Israel, where, where uh, Martin Luther King was an ardent supporter, where Jews were at the forefront of the civil rights movement um, in the 50s and 60s, particularly um, now Israel is uh, lumped together with any number of other, um, uh, I, I forget the terminology that you used, but, but we'll just say bad guys. Israel is bad guys to the progressive community. Yeah, bad actor states, they call them. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. I don't understand for a moment, though, the connection to intersectionality. That doesn't have anything to do with all that. Oh, no, it has total. It has total to do with it. Well, explain it to me then. I don't get it. Yeah, that, the, the people that talk about intersectionality don't usually talk about Israel. Oh, no, no. I Forgive me. I believe you're mistaken in, in, in this respect. Um, Palestinians are lumped together with indigenous communities, with, with you know, the, the oppressed blacks in, in, in America. That if one goes to any form of uh, uh, protest, We'll see PLO flags and oh yeah, uh, yeah, and and, and um, the Black Lives Movement has at its top people who are vociferously hostile to the state of Israel and to Jews and the Women's March and in the Women's March here in Chicago we had um, we had Jewish women uh, ejected because they were carrying an Israel flag. So this intersectionality thing is a really really big deal. Okay, okay, but I, I, I have to say, I agree with everything you're saying. I'm totally sympathetic with that. I think it's out of line. I think it's, uh, it's a, basically it grows out of a very immature um, a global political sense. Uh, uh, people who can't d distinguish between really bad actors uh, and, and, and states with whose policies uh, they might reasonably disagree. Uh, there's a big difference. But I, I really don't want to leave people with the idea that this has anything at all to do with intersectionality. When Kimberly Crenshaw talks about intersectionality, uh, she's not talking about uh, Palestinian rights or anything else. We're what she's talking about is that uh, people, particularly women, uh, are discriminated against from a variety of different angles uh, and the law doesn't respect that. They're discriminated against because they're women, because they're black, because they're gay, because they're disabled, uh, and, and so on. Uh, that's all that means. That doesn't have anything to do with, uh, uh, you know, the mixing up of, of Palestinians with, uh, uh, with formerly enslaved blacks and so on. I'm very unsympathetic uh, uh, to the uh, hostility to Israel. I'm very sympathetic uh, to the plight of Palestinians, but I also have an awful lot of, of uh, Israeli friends, uh, and I mean actually Israeli friends, who are sympathetic to the plight of Palestinians, but who are very anxious to point out uh, that to translate your sympathy for the Palestinians into hostility for uh, Israelis and Jews is simply wrong-headed. I'm totally in agreement with that. Uh, one of my best friends in the world is Rabbi, some of you would know him, uh, Levi Wyman Kelman, uh, who uh, runs or has just now retired, but from Congregation Kol HaNeshama, 
which is the long, largest reform congregation in uh, in Israel, which isn't saying much, but anyway, uh, and he's head of rabbi was head of rabbis for human rights, uh, a very strong advocate for uh, Palestinian causes, but also a very very vociferous advocate for Israel. Uh, and that, to me, that's balanced thinking. That's informed thinking. Uh, but uh, lose the intersectionality. This is not what intersectionality means. Having said that, I really agree that, you know, when I see uh, some of the people in Black Lives Matter uh, who are, uh, what they're trying to do is be sort of current and hip and modern uh, and and they see European demonstrators with uh, Palestinian flags and and so on. Uh, a lot of them uh, have no clue uh, what the dynamics of the situation are, and I'm completely unsympathetic to that. I agree with with everything else you said after the intersectionality part. How's that? Thank you. I think um, I think we're going to wind down or wind up. I want to thank you so much for being with us, Jim. Just a small side note, Levy Wyman Kelman, who was then just Levy Kelman, was my Hebrew school teacher. And the reason I do what I do today, he had a huge impact on my life. Um, so Levy himself did? Levy was my Hebrew school teacher. When he was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he was my Hebrew school teacher and is a big part of why I do what I do today. So, Well, he's one of my best friends. Well, it's lovely to hear his name. He, we have a lot of people connected to him here in this congregation. Thank you so much. This was enormously engaging, interesting. I think we all learned a great deal and it's always such a pleasure to have you here. And God, I said this a year ago, but God willing, we will have you in person sometime soon. So be I'm well, stay, stay safe, be healthy, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Nice to see you. Goodbye to all of our streamers. We I thank you for being here and we I'm gonna end the Zoom now. Yes. Rabbi uh Marston. Marston, is that how you pronounce it? Rabbi who?